so namaste Welcome. namaste timothy or actually i should say timothy g which is our uh, uh, way of addressing our elders and mentors uh, so welcome to our himsa conversations and uh, a heartfelt thanks for your mentoring presence in my life uh, these i think now two decades it's a great pleasure namaste to you rajni uh, and our friendship has been a wonderful joy for me and i'm always learning from you so um it's a pleasure to be with you today thank you thank you so much um so timothy let's start uh, in the sort of routine way that most conversations start by asking what may be your earliest recollection maybe from childhood even of the idea of non violence i didn't really come across the conception the idea of non violence as a child but i did grow up i was born into a very violent world the nuclear bombs had just gone off hiroshima nagasaki there had been all the slaughter of the second world war and <coughs> many of my family were soldiers my grandfather was a general so you could say i grew up in the context of war but you know strangely in my family it was deeply peaceful i never heard my mother or my father exchange angry words as children we were never hit and when i went to school i discovered this was unusual uh the first time i was ever beaten was at school by a master and you won't believe this rashni for being untidy um so i had no conception of violence but in a curious way it was a very non violent childhood i say deeply peaceful and it was a compassionate world too uh i remember one of my earliest memories is we had a gardener called mr viner and he'd been wounded in the war he was quite weak and uh so he liked to go to sleep quite often in the wheelbarrow and my mother said never ever wake him up be very quiet and the first great principle we learned as children was nobody must be humiliated a fundamental principle never humiliate anybody but the conception of non-violence i didn't really meet until i became a dominican i began to take part in in demonstrations against nuclear wars yeah before we go to that part of your life uh, timothy when uh, you have been a leader of the dominican order uh, i thought we could maybe go a bit back into history uh, a lot of us from a distance uh, tend to feel that christ inaugurates the concept of nonviolence in western culture and western civilization is that a fair assumption or are there deeper roots before that that there are deeper roots rachni if you go back to the 6 centuries before christ you will find the emergence of visions of universal peace uh the wonderful in the prophet isaiah he probably wrote it about 520 years before christ he has this wonderful vision of when the wolf and the child will be together and the lion will eat grass and there will be peace on my holy mountain and no harm shall be done and then you have this famous figure called the suffering servant who submits to violence but refuses violence in return so when christ is born 600 years later 500 years later and they're trying to understand him they often go back to this earlier tradition where you see um, the seeds you might say of a dream of universal peace the end to all violence so that's already there not a strong voice but it's already there in the tradition is there any reason to believe that the message of the buddha which by the time of christ's birth 
has been around at that time for about 500 years. Is there any reason to believe that that may have played a role even in the Western emergence of this concept? Well, of course, it's quite possible. You see, if you think at that time, there was far more trade than people have imagined with uh, the evolution of the Silk Road and all sorts of ways of communication, even in Britain, barbarous little Britain, right on the edge of the empire, you find artifacts which are made in India and in the East. So it's quite possible that along with the, the trade of goods, there was also the trade of ideas. So I wouldn't be surprised because Isaiah would have been writing about the same time as the Buddha. Indeed. So these, hmm. Yes. No, no, go ahead, please. Hmm. And so I think the non-violent Jesus, as you see, we know that parts of, of uh, Christianity had their roots not only in Judaism, but also in Greek, the Greek world, mm. the Greek world of wisdom, the Roman world of law, mm. the Persian world of, of, uh, of law too, before that. So why not? Why not expect and think it's quite appropriate that there would be influences from far over Asia, from India, for example. Yes. It would make perfect sense. Yes, yes. You have in many different places very movingly written about this core message of, uh, to again, to us novices, it's usually we think of it as the essence of the Sermon on the Mount. But I would request you to, uh, for our purposes here, to repeat your understanding of what is this, this uh, how is it formulated? And uh, why is this truth, in a sense, echoing down to us 2000 years later? Well, you see, I think it's not just what Jesus said, it's what he did. That he, he turned the other cheek. And when they came to arrest him, his followers put up their swords. And he said, put down your swords. And when somebody was attacked by one of his followers, he healed the man who'd been attacked. So he embodied nonviolence. He didn't just speak of it. And so the central symbol of Christianity, a man hanging wounded on a cross, is a man who refused to repay violence for violence. Um, and who even forgave the people who were put him on that cross, saying, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. So at the essence of it, was, I think, a profound rejection of, of any violence. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. The whole world, the, the, the Judeo-Christian world before then, well, the Jewish world had been dominated by the limitation of violence. An eye for an eye was not to legitimate violence, it was to restrict it. Not ten, eye, not ten eyes for an eye, not a hundred eyes for an eye, but only one. But Jesus turns that round and was, tries to eliminate all vengeance from our personal relationships. There is also uh, the, I think, massive evolutionary leap in taking love from the personal realm to the from wider the from, love from a personal feeling to a wider uh, social and moral and spiritual possibility. Uh, could you elaborate on that, please? Absolutely. Uh, the people the, who reflected on Christianity in the 20, 30 years after Christ's death all speak of the gathering into unity, not just of, uh, of Jews and Gentiles as us, but of the whole of creation. All things must be gathered into one. Paul writes to that to the Ephesians. These are people who were alive when Christ was alive. 
So right at the very beginning is the idea that a universal love is, uh, is to be longed for, is to be given. And of course, it's the love the Christian believe is the very being of God. When we talk about God as a trinity, it's not a numerical statement. You can't go and say one, two, three, I spot you all in heaven. It's the vision of the divine life as relational. And a relational love, which is an equal love. I think that's part of what was extraordinary in that first vision, is that at the heart of the divine love was equality. And that any true love is always a lifting into equality. Friendship and love can never tolerate abiding inequality. And because we see our world torn more and more by growing inequalities, which is, of course, a form of, of terrible violence. This reminds me of a beautiful story that um, Lewis Hyde, who has written some profound um, books on uh, the commons, uh, and he's most famous actually for a book called The Gift, uh, where he quotes the moment uh, just before the soldiers are going to take Jesus away uh, to the cross when the woman comes with the very expensive, uh, you know, uh, herbal oil to mm -hmm. anoint his feet. And, uh, and the, uh, I'm, I'm telling the story not for your sake, but for those who will watch this. <laughs> and the other disciples say, oh, but let's sell this very expensive oil and distribute the money to the poor outside. And Christ says at that moment, the poor you shall always have with you. And Lewis Hyde is saying, his point in telling the story is that what that woman brought was not oil, but pure love. Mm -hmm. And by thinking of the oil as a commodity, as something that could be monetized, uh, the disciples have missed the point. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this moment. Uh, that's wonderful. And of course, uh, I love that book, uh, The Gift. I think it's a beautiful book. And he's quite right, I think, about the tendency to commodification, which you found, and it increases in Western history, uh, right up until, really, I suppose you'd say the 16th century, it was not believed that land and water and air were commodities. They were gifts. You may own the right of use, but nobody could absolutely own land. But what you find is the commodification even of the soil that we stand on and the, the water and, and the fertility of trees. And we see this continuation of, of commodification right up to our own century, when people tried to commodify the genetic inheritance of seeds so that uh, farmers become forever dependent on people who own the DNA, own the genetic codes. If we go back to that beautiful first, that moment of the pouring of the oil, of course, it's also looking forward to the moment when he shall die. And um, they will come to pour oil on his body and he will not be there. He will have risen. There's only an empty tomb. So this pouring of all this gift of love, as you say, is so important because it grabs the moment. And so often, you know, in our lives, we're tempted to say, oh, I'll tell somebody I love them later. I'll do this good deed for them later. But the later doesn't always come. So we have to act now when we see people who are in need when we see people who are suffering, when we see people we love. I often think, you know, well, I, we live, I live certainly in the knowledge that I might die before too long. Will I have told the people that I love that I love them? Or will I wait until it's too long, too late? 
indeed. Um, but what happened along the way, Timothy? As <laughs> <laughs> back to the historical uh, train, and I think this happened maybe in all the great moments and that opened enormous possibilities for our species. Um, though, of course, there is Taylor de Chardin who says that Christ is out of sequence in the evolutionary journey, but he is uh, a signal of what we are destined to become. Mm -hmm. Sign of the end to which we are called. Yes. The end of all evolution. Oh, yes, so that is, that's what we are destined to be because yeah. uh, the very uh, 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 fact of Christ uh, is evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. That it is, it is possible. Now, you have spoken with great feeling about Gandhi being a similar kind of evidence. Would you like to elaborate on that here? Because you have talked in public uh, uh, pla on public platforms about how, in a sense, Gandhi recovered the nonviolence in Christ. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, perhaps I could first say that that nonviolence never entirely disappeared. All the way through history, you find uh, movements, sometimes limited, sometimes small, for to seek nonviolence. You had in the in the tenth century, so uh, a thousand years after Christ, when we Christianity was already part of the great empires. You have the great movement for the peace of God, the Pax Day, and then another on the truth of God, where limited they try to limit war, forbid all the harming of non-combatants, of women and children and merchants. Um, the great battle of the Middle Ages was against the crossbow, which was considered too brutal to be used in warfare. So it was for, its use was forbidden by popes from the 11th century onwards. I mean, it, it weren't, they weren't obeyed, of course, and crossbows were used. But you always had this tension, I think, between, if you want, the surrender to the compulsion of violence often for the sake of the state, and pockets of resistance, which go right the way through in the 19th century, you see the First World War, you see all sorts of pacifist movements, people arrested for, for opposing all violence. Ben Salmon, who was a, a Catholic layperson, he was sentenced to death in the United States for his refusal to fight or the Bishop of Utah, who was uh, removed from his post under America, he was Episcopalian, American Episcopalian, because he refused to condone war. And of course, Leo Tolstoy, whose uh, famous book, The Kingdom is Within You, was profoundly influential on Gandhi. So I think what you see is, is Gandhi was of immense importance in the West. He greatly influenced people like Dorothy Day, the American pacifist, Thomas Merton, a Cistercian monk. But you also see other currents which influenced Gandhi. So I think we, we all influence each other all the time. I'm sure rationally we influence each other. Uh, and that's the fruit. For sure, you do. You have influenced me deeply. Uh, well, it's, it goes both ways, as it always should. The flow of ideas, the interchange. So I think Gandhi summoned us back. His stark, uncompromising nonviolence woke up, if you want, Christianity to its earliest roots. The first 300 years, you know. Christianity was in a non-violent religion. Nobody could be a soldier for the first 300 years. Anyone who was baptized had to renounce being in the army. And Gandhi summoned us back to ourselves. And that was a, a great blessing, a great gift. Yes. How have you seen this energy 
uh, unfold and in a sense play out in your working life because you have been engaged uh, both as a Dominican brother and as an activist in various kinds of efforts for social justice. You head a center at Blackfriars, uh, which is dedicated to uh, social justice and human rights. So how is this energy playing out in our times? Particularly, I mean, I'm, I'm really keen to hear you articulate your perspective on this because if you people who just read the newspapers think the opposite is happening, that you know, we are being overwhelmed by darkness. Well, I suppose the roots of my experience were going back to uh, the campaign for nuclear disarmament. The belief that uh, the possession of nuclear weapons was not justified. It is never moral to, to retain the possibility of doing something so deeply immoral. So many of the brethren here were involved. We got arrested, climbed into camps, uh, people tied them, chained themselves to nuclear weapons. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of people were rather disgusted and thought we were terrible. But there was a profound revulsion of the whole idea of nuclear weapons. And of course, I was born in their shadow, as I said, just after their first use. And it's now, isn't it, actually, with the war in Ukraine, where again, for the first time since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, for the first time, we are confronted with the possibility of nuclear war in the West. And I suppose it hovers over the relationships of India and Pakistan too. And if that were to happen, we could imagine humanity destroying itself. The earth could become a desert. We get to somewhere like Mars and we see just a desert. We could make this place barren and infertile. So I think there's more than ever at this moment in our lives, there is the need to calm, if you want, the violent passions which are sweeping the world. I mean, I long for the Ukraine to be freed of Russian invasion, but we have to not fall into the danger of therefore making Russians somehow incarnations of evil that we want to kill. There's a terrible thing in the mood, mood in the air at the moment, of vengeance. And if we do that, we will create more vengeance and more vengeance, and it will never be ending. I think, I don't know about in India, but certainly in Britain, we see people resisting that rising tide of, of violence, which is in the air all the time. How far we will succeed? The Pope has tried. The Pope is trying. Um, he said that he denounces, he denounces Putin. He denounces the invasion. He says the Ukrainians are heroes. But he said, let us look at our own complicity in violence. Let's not project it all on the Russians. And for this, he's denounced by people. But I suppose that whenever you oppose violence, you're always going to be denounced, aren't you? Uh, certainly by those in power, uh, by mm. those who have control of formal power, or mm. at least authority, even if it's not real power, uh, mm. in the sense that uh, we would like to define power as that which grows between people out of a sense of mutual respect, and um, and 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 uh, mutual coexistence mm -hmm. in that sense yes but ukraine has given rise to another uh, dilemma uh, timothy that um, when we see those people standing in front of the there, there have been some very evocative pictures of mm -hmm. people standing peacefully unarmed uh, blocking the way of the tanks uh, which is the, uh, it's a kind of, it's the iconic image of, of nonviolent resistance. Uh, a lot of people turn around and say, oh, well, what good does that do? See, the, the, the tank moved on. How do you respond to that? 
uh, because the, you know this image of the person standing in front of this tank whether it's in Tiananmen Square uh, now yeah. what 30 years ago or Ukraine it, it gives rise to these two opposite one at one end we are accused of being romantic and on the other side we think the people who think we are romantic are heartless so <laughs> what is the reality here uh, my my trust is that if we look at each other's faces, uh, then violence subsides. It's very difficult to be violent when you see somebody. Normally, we're violent against abstractions. We're violent because the other person has become symbolic of what we hate. But when we see them, we see their faces, we see their eyes. Can we really then be violent? Which is why in Tiananmen Square, they didn't run over a solitary person. There will be people who will suffer for standing in front of tanks, who will be killed, but there will also be conversions. So I think that if we want to promote non-violence, the first thing is let our faces be seen, and let others see our faces. I, I've recounted to you the incident in Algeria. Which That's was, right. I was going to ask you to please tell that story. Yeah. I was in the desert and the Sahara with a, a, a Christian bishop, my brother, fellow Dominican. And we got caught up in a violent confrontation between the army and an insurgency. We were there in the middle. And suddenly our, our car, small car, old car, Bishop couldn't afford a very expensive one, uh, was surrounded by protesters with stones. And I shall never forget this young man standing in front of the windscreen with a stone. And I thought, if he throws that through the windscreen, we're finished. But if only I can see him, if only he can see me. And I remember looking at him, looking at him in the eyes, and I could see there the hatred. But behind the hatred, I saw a chap who was afraid. Maybe wondering what he was getting into. And then beneath the fear, I saw a young man who his mother loved. I thought if only we could look at each other, the violence would cease. And then the bishop found that I was looking at the chap, the bishop was looking for a way. He found a way out, accelerated, and we were away. Some people threw stones, but thanks be to God, they were too heavy. So they didn't go through the windows. They just harmed the base of the car. But I think the human face is the great summons to peace. The human eyes. Can you look somebody in the eye? and then her heart, her, sorry, harm them or hurt them. You see, for me, Christianity is a religion of the face. Israel always said, let your face shine on us and we shall be saved. And uh, Christianity believes that face became a human face who looked at people, looked at the suffering. And that therefore all our ministry, all our work, all our preaching, everything begins with being faces, learning to look, learning to let ourselves be seen, learning to let the masks drop, the naked, vulnerable human face. Uh, is, why is this not helping us or is it helping us and we don't realize it uh, to get past there's so many bitter divisions between religions in our time uh, and i know it is a paradox because there are millions and millions of us of different faiths who are living peacefully and lovingly with each other and yet on the global scale there is uh, enough bad news that makes it look as though Religions are, you know, in clash. What is happening? You see, I think if you, even if you look at the Middle East, which now is such a place of confrontation, for centuries there were on the whole beautiful relationships 
between Muslims, Christians, Jews, Yazidis. And I think what ruined it uh, was, was the rise of nationalism. Nationalism, fierce, bitter nationalism, which often claimed to be secular, but which weaponized religion. You see it in Turkey with the rise of Ataturk, who claimed to be secular, but you see the weaponization of Islam under him and the beginning of genocide. And I think all over the world, you see religion is used to, um, as a focus for identity over against other people. Whereas the great religions of the world invite us to open our identity. My identity should be inseparable from the people that I meet, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Muslim, the Jew. I should be opening my, my very being to them. Identity lies ahead. Identity isn't completely known yet, but all pilgrims on the way to knowing who we are. But nationalism gives us closed identities, aggressive identities. And religion is a very simple way of doing that. It's also part of a new fundamentalism, which is sweeping the world. Nationalistic fundamentalism, economic fundamentalism, which says there's only the market. Everything is about the market. Um, the scientific fundamentalism, Ever, all consciousness is just a movement, electricity in your brain. And all this feeds into religious fundamentalism, which people think is somehow medieval. It isn't medieval, it's modern. I think all the great religions in the Middle Ages, our different Middle Ages, were open to metaphor, for imagination, for pilgrimage, for search. But I'm afraid modernity tends, us, tends to push us towards closed, literalistic, simplistic languages, which in the end shut out other people and mean that we each claim dominance and sole possession of the truth. But the truth always lies ahead. Uh, so what in this context gives you faith for interfaith dialogue? And I know you've been involved in so many of these efforts. It's above all because uh, in the best of dialogues, you meet fellow seekers. I think that you always need in any conversation the confidence to say something. You've got something to say, but the humility to learn. If you feel you've got it all wrapped up, that you know all the answers, that you come only to tell people, it's going to be a very boring conversation. And the beautiful conversations are one where you don't know quite where it's going. You let it surprise you. Good conversation is a little bit uncontrollable. And I, that's my experience. Yes. When I've had good conversations with people of other faiths, they invite me to go further. I don't understand their faith better, I understand my own faith better. So I think confidence and humility go together. And if you're just confident, it'll be boring for them. Yeah. If you're just entirely humble and don't say anything, it won't be any use. Yes. So we're fellow travellers. Yeah. You've also often said that if this is possible when we are willing to live with the ambiguities in ourselves and the reality around us. Is there Absolutely. any example? Is there any example of that which comes to mind at this moment? Well, you know, this might be a bit technical, but Thomas Aquinas was fascinated by the question, will we see God? And Half his theology said, well, no, we don't. Nobody can see God. It's impossible to see God. The other half of him thought, well, no. Will I not see face to face as we are promised? And that ambiguity lay at the heart of his theology. And I think most of the fruitful things, the, the exciting things we do, were moved on because we haven't quite resolved an ambiguity. 
I think also a lot of us have got ambiguities in our personal lives. Do we want to leave home or do we want to stay at home? Um, do I love this other person or don't I love them? And living with the personal ambiguities like this, I think is very fruitful. It requires patience. You have to dwell in that ambiguity, unafraid. I think nearly all great poetry dwells in the ambiguity and doesn't run away from it. Yes. Because if you live with it, then somehow you can find your way forward to a new synthesis, a new insight, uh, a new beauty. Yes. Because I think beauty carries you on beyond for past contradictions. Yeah. In this context, and also to, to close our conversation for now, for today, uh, how, how do young people manage this? Because they are living in an age when they are, uh, which seems to be dominated by the binary divide. I mean, the technology is based on a binary divide. And every day of their very extensive preoccupation with social media is, you know, like dislike. It's like the whole of life has been reduced. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it hasn't been, but sometimes it does feel like that. So what is your advice to young people going forward? Because I meet many who want to seek peace and nonviolence, but they don't know how, and they are struggling with that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's a terrible tendency in England at the moment towards no platforming. If you disagree with somebody, shut them up. If you don't like the views of somebody coming to speak in the university, have the invitation cancelled. Don't let them say anything. Uh, but that, in the end, is a council of despair. And I think we have to have the courage to open ourselves to people who think differently. Um, because they will have a truth. They will have some insight which I need, we may think at the end still that they are wrong, yeah. but we may have learned something. Yeah. And you have to have the imagination to ask, why is it that they think this? Why is it? How could it be? What have they lived? What's their experience? What have they loved? What have they suffered? What do they fear? And your imagination, you try to get under their skin to understand why they hold that view. Mm. Um, it's not, we're not just rational beings. Reason is wonderful, we've talked about it. I love it. It's very precious in our humanity, but perhaps even more deeply, we are imaginative beings. And our imagination carries us into other experience to discover the riches I had a wonderful thing. You know, when I joined the order, I came to Blackfriars and there was a, a brother from, Ru from Rwanda. He was a Burundi, he was a, a Hutu. Utterly different from anything that I'd ever known in my life. There was a Mexican brother whom we all loved. Uh, later on, I got to know Indian brothers and sisters. And this is the extraordinary joy, I think, of difference. Difference is fertile. Different, we know it in our, we're both due to difference ourselves, aren't we, actually? Yeah. Mothers and fathers. A difference produces what we could never expect. So I think I would say, don't be afraid of difference. Don't platform anybody. Don't silence anybody. Of course, there are some views which are so horrific, like people who deny the Holocaust of the Jews in the last century. I understand that that should not be allowed to be sex. It's a complete nonsense. But, but most differences we can attend to. Yes. On the General Council, we had one rule. Never dismiss another view as absurd. Because I don't agree. I think it's illogical, misinformed, yeah. but never ridiculous. Mm. I think we should not be protective of our identities. Mm. We live in a time of identity politics, gender identity, religious identity, ethnic identity. And one of the reasons for polarization are battles over identity. 
but none of us have finally achieved identity. Mm. Fullness of identity lies ahead. Yes. One of my favorite lines in the New Testament is, who we are is yet to be revealed. Mm. We're only travelers. Whereas if I settle down into some fixed identity which I must defend yes. against aggressors, I will never grow. I will shrivel up. I will become a small person, maybe nobody at all. Yeah. How do you deal with a situation, sometimes you must have faced it, when you're faced with a person who is filled with hate or uh, has such a uh, violent uh, reaction against either somebody or some idea, uh, that is sometimes that kind of encounter can you know make it difficult to love and listen how do you deal with that and and then we really will close <laughs> I, I, i've experienced to some extent some people who very conservative right-wing christians have taken the greatest like to me and uh, i remember going to dublin and i was told i needed police protection i said i've been to rwanda i've been to iraq i've been to syria i don't need police protection um, but they insisted, and they, they tried to protect me from these protesters. But once the police had gone, I met them. And we sat down, and patiently, I, just, I could show, I didn't believe what they thought I believed. They were caught in mythology. It, it takes a lot of time and patience. One day I received an email from an angry man, an angry Polish man early in the morning, denouncing me as an awful person. And I said, oh, interesting, why? And he said, well, you said this and you, and I said, no, I never did, it's quite untrue. It took the whole day. Finally, by the end of the day, we laughed. This is what we hope for, isn't it? To arrive at laughter yes. and be liberated. Yes. It doesn't always work. There was another man I, I dialogued with for about three weeks, but he, he simply could not listen. At the end, I said after three weeks, but I'm afraid, Joe, we'd have to go our different ways, but maybe one day we'll be able to talk. You can never say never, as James That's Bond said. Never <laughs> say never. Never say never. That's true. <laughs> and that is that leaving that door and window open. Mm. I think is what reinforces your point about identity is forward. Yeah, that's right. The door is open. You don't know when that knock will come yeah. or when you will have to knock, yeah. but it'll come sometime. Yeah. And which in a sense is the power of that, what, which we don't know in exactly. this moment. Because Thanks. we are, as somebody said, we're, we're beings, sorry, we're becomings more than we're beings. We're flowing yes. water more than solid rocks. Yes. And all water finds its way down to the big open ocean and mingles. Indeed. Indeed. Like the Ganges. Absolutely. And, and in that sense, it, that Ganges here is a metaphor for all flow, all movement, all water. Thank you so much. And I wish you the best of health. Thank you so much, Rajin. I hope we meet again soon. I do. I do too. Okay. God, God bless. bless. Thank you.